You are watching the biggest, the largest, the highest, the greatest, and the tallest African spiritual platform. I'm always queen. Hadasha call me Empress Makida. I am Labraska, the sun goddess. I welcome you to another great episode. When uh, there is a female guest, my vibration is a little bit different. I am happy to see my, my colleague woman on set. So let's welcome our guest for today. Mami, we welcome you to Revelations. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. We welcome you. Please, today is your first time. Yes. 400,000 people are watching you now. Mm. So I want you to pay obeisance to them, like greet them mm -hmm. and introduce yourself to us. Sure, sure. So I'm Carnito Groves. As you can tell by my voice, I was not born and raised in Ghana, but I was born and raised in the States, Denver, Colorado. I've been in Ghana now as of February 19th, 10 consecutive years. This November, I would have had my citizenship five years. So I was in the group in November 2016, the group of 126 that got their citizenship uh, via presidential decree. I was in that group, so some of you may be familiar with that uh, event that made international news. So a little bit more about me. My background is psychology. I was educated academically in the States. And uh, my people on my father's side and my mother's father's side come from Madagascar. And my mother's mother's people are Yoruba. And I'm a Ghanaian citizen, so I'm multicultural. And I, my first time in Ghana actually was in 2000. It was the conference the International Association of Black Psychologists, and over 500 of us came here for that conference in 2000. And so that was my first time on the continent anywhere. And in fact, for a lot of us, it was our first time, and it was actually magnificent. It was quite powerful. Left enough of an impact on me that I'm back here now hmm. permanently. So as a psychologist or a background in psychology, I work holistically. So I say that I'm a Pan-African holistic psychologist. And so that's how, I, that's how I work with people. So the way that we think in our mood states is holistic in nature. It's not just being sad about an event, but it could be a nutrient deficiency that can be creating the low mood that we're in. It could be a lifestyle, toxins in the environment, such as burning, open burning of trash that could be c uh, contributing to my problems with learning. It could be any number of things. So I work holistically with people as well. You are welcome. Thank you. Is there any reason why you are dressed like this? Is this, is this um, a, a fashion something or it is spiritual? Oh, it's both. It's both. I dress... When I was in the States, many years before I came to Ghana, I only wore African clothes, only. Whether I'm in the court, whether I'm in the classroom, whether I'm at the hardware store trying to buy a hammer or a screwdriver, whether I'm in the garden, I'm wearing African clothes. And in fact, I just saw, maybe not quite two weeks ago, a presentation on YouTube by Dr. Joe Dispenza. And he was, interestingly, for the first time that I've ever heard uh, a white man do, especially a white man, a neuroscientist of his caliber, talk about the impact of what we wear on our psyche. So I do it for spiritual reasons or for, for psychic reasons. I do it for cultural reasons. But fashion-wise, it's exquisite. Come on. I mean, I can't wear anything other than African clothes that's this beautiful, that's this amazing. So What, what I even wanted to understand is your spiritual aspect of everything yes. with you from your hair yes. to your rings to I want to know whether they are fashion or they have spiritual significance if yes explain yes it's mostly spiritual so for instance my hair um, there are the international uh, black women's congress I believe was where I first learned about the science of our hair, of our locks, of our coils. And these women, among these women, was a cadre of scientists who explained the metaphysical aspects of natural hair. Never knew that. It was also the first time I ever saw black women with hair down to their knees, down to their calves, down to their ankles, some of it dragging on the floor, and it's their natural hair. I would later come to learn that I believe it's women in Mali, 
I think also have very, very long hair, but it's not in locks. It's just their natural hair. And it's typically to their knees, to their calves. So there's a lot of spiritual significance in that in terms of how the energy from the sun impacts the, the uh, characteristics of the coils of our hair, as well as the naturalness of the hair that coincides with the natural way that we be in the world as African women. So there's spirituality uh, to that as well. Also to colors. We know that colors, if you talk to the right scientists, they'll tell you that colors are vibrations. And each color has a particular vibrational frequency to it. So as we wear these bright, vivid colors, we are, we are literally attaching a vibrational frequency to us, as well as in some cultures, we're using it to ward off negativity or evil spirits because of the brightness of the color. So there's a lot of cultural aspects to it. There's a lot of spiritual aspects to it. But but fashion-wise, if we can use the word fashion here, it's just spectacular to wake up every day to see the different types of textiles that we are wearing and that others are wearing. So when you say spirituality, what is your concept of spirituality? I like that question. For me, spirituality is science, and science is spirituality. And I feel that historically, African people always knew that science and spirituality were happily married, always has been, always will be. For people who perhaps are off their center, they see the two at odds. But I see the two, as many of our ancestors do, as happily married. So for me, spirituality is science, and science is spirituality. And, and when we talk about the power of suggestion in particular, uh, the more I talk about it, I think the more your viewers will begin to see, oh yeah, I do see the, 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 the the vibrational or the energetic part or the spiritual part of it and then the science part of it. I get it. I get it. Okay, yes. And I think people will see more of it. But yeah, that's for me science is spirituality and spirituality is science. Okay, so you have Kauris as a ring mm -hmm. and then you have Jinyami mm -hmm. as a, and then you have Ankh mm -hmm. also as a ring and then you have um, Crystal yes. also in your head. Quartz. Yes. Mm -hmm. What are the significance? So the, sometimes when I'm, as we wake up and we're getting dressed, sometimes we have time to think about what we want to wear. And other times we'll just grab something. In either instance, it could be something that is ancestral in terms of its influence, in terms of its draw, or it could be something that's more intentional in terms of the energies we're vibrating to and what we want to do. So when I think of the cowrie shell that is on my supposedly wedding ring finger, <laughs> for some cultures, it's not for all cultures around the world, this one helps me to remember to keep things in its proper perspective, that I'm not validated by whether or not I'm married. I'm validated by whether or not I exist and I'm being productive. So this today helps me as a reminder for this one. The, the plain ring that you see on my small finger has to do with ornating the smallest or the weakest part and to not take the little things for granted, to place value on the small things because sometimes the small things are some of the most important things in life. And then of course the Adinkra symbols and the Ankh, these are African symbols that have specific uh, meaning, specific significance, so in one way or another maybe strongly, maybe a little bit, I'm sort of tying in and vibing with that. The onk is a ring that I never take off. It's on when I'm bathing, sleeping, cooking, showering, gardening, whatever it is that I'm doing, it always stays on. The male and female symbol of it, the ancient high society, high, high culture aspect of it, it keeps that in the forefront of my awareness that we were not animals swinging from trees. We in fact had very high societies millennia ago. And so use that in the back of your mind as you go forward to address modern problems. Know that you already have a wealth of information with which to move through life and you don't have to imitate anybody other than your ancestors. So the Ankh helps to keep that in the forefront. And the crystal? So the crystal is quartz 
and I'm into very much stones and crystals. Uh, in fact, when I was coming to Ghana, I had so many in my suitcase, I didn't have actually enough clothes, so when I got here, I had to start <laughs> buying clothes because <laughs> I had too many crystals and books in my suitcase. So the quartz crystal that I'm wearing right now, one of the properties of quartz spiritually is for clarity and higher thinking. And so I'm wearing this particular quartz, not on my ears, not on my finger, not on my wrist, but uh, near my third eye. And so this is to help me to remember the power of clear thinking, tap into, stay focused with the clear thinking. And as we say in science, don't stray far from the data, stick to what you know, and you'll be okay. Any reason why you, had, you have a lot of crystals? I'm, I'm absolutely impressed and amazed with the power of stones and crystals. And unfortunately, it's not explored enough. For instance, I have a medical book titled Vibrational Medicine, and there's a chapter in that medical book where a surgeon is talking about how he uses bloodstone. He puts it in his pocket when he goes to do surgery, the vibrational frequency of bloodstone to help him with his work. And I'm a big believer that there are vibrational properties of these stones and crystals that have a subtle impact on us. And when we use them to grid the room or physical space or do body layouts with people, we can physically feel it, literally. So I did a book where I wrote a case study of 11 people ages two years old to an early 70s. And I did different types of experiments with these 11 individuals with stones and crystals. And the, the case studies produce some really surprising outcomes that cannot be attributed to coincidence. So I'm a big believer in stones and crystals. What's your favorite crystal? Probably Labradorite. I like Labradorite. It's, it's just a beautiful, magical looking kind of stone, very unusual. Um, it's just they, they use it sometimes to make dishes, to make sinks, to make bathtubs. It's just it gives me goosebumps and chills just to think about how it looks. Labradorite is one of my one of my top favorites. Mm. You are watching the biggest. I have over four thousand crystals in my office. I'm selling them. We don't like buying them. You see? Mm, let's leave it there. I'm happy you said you are an African, you are from Yoruba and then Madagascar. Mm -hmm. But you grew up out there in the States. Our brothers and sisters there, how do you see them? Is there anything they are battling with in terms of emotions? I mean, in terms of this slave trade, everything that has happened to us, everything that took them there. Looking at them, you schooling there, I think you have you have connected with some of them. What are three things that you will say we should help them deal with? Another wonderful question. I think that our family on the continent make the mistake of thinking they don't have anything to offer, anything of substance to offer to the diaspora, those Africans who have been scattered out of the ma'afa. And we do. They struggle with identity. A lot of African Americans have, believe it or not, have not connected the dot that they're Africans. They'll say things like, I'm an American. It's like, okay, that's where you were born, but what are you? Oh, I'm an American, you see. They will struggle with bitterness about you sold us, as if the whole of Africa was completely by itself responsible for the transatlantic slave trade and the 1500 year Arab enslavement. And yet we have experts like Michael M. Hotep, who has a wonderful YouTube channel, who has told us that actually Africans selling other Africans account for about 8%, about 8% of the entirety. Now, to what extent is that number accurate? We're not entirely sure, but what it tells us is that that type of feeling, that type of negativity is not justified with a number that low. But people will react as though it is. So identity is a really a big thing that people need to struggle with. Maintaining cultural continuity is another big thing I think we can be helped with. There's a lot of things that Africans in America do that is absolutely African that they don't know is African. And they need to know so that they can cherish it 
and honor it. There are things that we were told when we were being brought up. If you're having your menses, don't do this, don't do this, because the old wives tell said that this and this will happen to you. If you cut your hair or comb your hair or you're cleaning your hair out of a comb, don't just put it anywhere. When you're cutting your fingernails and your toenails, collect it and hide it or something. Don't let people get at it. It's all these different, different, different things that we had growing up that we may think is nonsense or silliness and not realize how close it is to culture. But then there's things that we do where childbearing is concerned that's very distinctively African and we may not even know it. We may not even realize it. So I think this is another thing that our family on the continent can help us with uh, when it comes to those types of things. And then repatriation is the, the big thing now, right? And so it's huge to help us with that. The reality is a lot of folks are coming back home and they're broken. They're torn up, they're devastated. Just because they're looking and walking and talking professional, maybe they're smelling nice, doesn't mean they have it all together. They have been in the belly of the beast. They have gone through it. And so people are coming back to you and they need help that they don't know they need. And I think that this is another way that we can dip, dip into the rich wells of culture and spirituality to assist them. You are watching The Biggest. So your, the last question that we come into your topic, okay? So those coming, you've been here for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that take some of you back to America? Three. I think some of the challenges that take us back is not doing proper research, which is also part of the reason why too many of us here want to go there. We're very naive and we're not doing proper research. If we did, we wouldn't want to go. Not doing proper research. Getting a lay of the land. It's okay to romanticize coming back home, that's fine, but you can't only romanticize. That can't be your prime directive, your modus operandi. You need to have a better reason for that. So proper research is a big one. Knowing, learning the different areas, learning the different little nuances to Ghanaian culture, learning for the most part how people are gonna perceive you, how they're gonna respond, and how you should respond to that in a very productive way, a way that moves you forward. That's a really big one. Another thing that happens when people come here, they don't somehow manage to look at their finances in a proper way. So they look at the dollar to CD ratio and it's as though they think they have all the money in the world to just live large hmm. and in charge. And it's not long before they realize that they've run out of money, they don't have a means to make up for it because they didn't do proper research to say, how can I, now that I'm here, create additional streams of income? They were just wholly reliant if they're a pensioner on their pension or the money that they came here with, and that was it. And this is not good financial planning. It's not anything they're gonna teach you in an MBA program. Mm. If you're working on a degree in economics and finance, they're not gonna teach you that. They're gonna teach you different rules about money and income and finance and wealth. So I would say a second reason is that people are not doing good financial planning. I think a third reason is some of the little things now that we see creeping out on social media, and that is, um, not overcoming one's inept social skills. You know, in America, it's a very individualistic culture. And even though we're Africans in America, it still infects us. So we come here with some of those attitudes, with some of that individuality. And because of social media and how it dumbs us down where social skills and interpersonal development is concerned, we lose the effectiveness and the ability to interact with people in a way that helps us acclimate. It's like we come here with arrested development. And so I think this is a third reason that people begin to leave because they say it's us against them. They don't really like us. They don't this, they don't this. And what's happening is that they're acknowledging without realizing they're acknowledging it, that they fail to really develop the personal skills you see, the social skills. If every time I sit down, I'm on my cell phone, how am I gonna develop social skills? How am I gonna learn how to talk to someone on a date if it's just me and my cell phone? These skills become undeveloped. They become unripened. So when you arrive in a culture somewhere, you're gonna be having a more difficult time than had you done like our people from the day where you had to get out and learn how to interact with people. So I think that's the third reason. Okay. so. Um, a lot of people are watching us, like I said, big, old, small, medium. One thing you love 
about Ghana, one thing that you love about Ghana, and that one thing you wish we could take away from this place? Oof. Oh my goodness. I wish you'd ask me 20 things I love about Ghana, one. but I'll find one, mm -hmm. I'll, go, I'll do one. Mm -hmm. How do I say this? I love the way that Ghanaians are Ghanaians. I love the Ghana-ness. I love it, Papa. I, I, I love it to a fault. I love it to a fault. I can't stay mad or disappointed for long because I'll see a smile, I'll see a statement, someone will do something, and before I know it, I'm like, you got me, you got me, you got me. It's, it's the way that you express the fullness when you give yourself the chance, when you give yourself the opportunity, the way that you express the fullness of your Ghanaian-ness is breathtaking. It slays me. It's mesmerizing. It's brilliant. It's seductive. It's scientific. It's everything good. And I'm just captured by it. And that one thing you want us to take, this, this is amazing, but that one thing you want us to take it far from us, that bad thing. The bad, oh, hmm. religion. 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 If I could put, if I could be president of Ghana tomorrow. Which I is would, not possible. Which is not possible. I would ban all religions. You would ban? I would ban it. It would not be possible. It would not be possible. It's the power of suggestion that along with religion, religion has killed more people than all wars combined. It has killed more people than all wars combined. It is, it is laced, there's enough good in it to deceive people into complacency, but the lethality of it, I don't think in mass we'll ever be able to get our arms around. If there's one thing, it would be religion. You are watching the biggest too, no question. We are getting into her topic, the power of suggestion. Mm -hmm. When they say suggestion, please define suggestion and then take us through your topic. Sure. So suggestion is as the word implies, that I'm not telling you something in an authoritative, dogmatic, absolute way. I'm just saying it in a way that you could take it or leave it. But I really don't want you to leave it. I want you to take it. And so it's a suggestion. It could be harmless, you know. Uh, I could say something as simple as, you know, if you just put the pillow behind your back, it won't put so much a strain on your neck. It could be something that harmless. Um, and so that's what suggestion is. Okay, so your topic is the power of suggestion. Yes. So take us through. Yes. So we, when we think about the power of suggestion, I would be willing to wager that we most often we tend to think maybe of magicians doing magic tricks, hypnotizing people, or we think of something metaphysical and let's chant and meditate and all these types of things, and that's fine. But my first personal experience into just how powerful suggestion can be was when my youngest child, my son, was getting ready to graduate from high school many years ago. Uh, this was when I was in the States. And I wanted to surprise him by having uh, his sister, one of his sisters at the time was living in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I wanted to fly her out as a surprise for him. They get along famously well, and I knew he would just be so excited. It would be a wonderful graduation gift. But I needed him to help me go to the airport to get her and her children, but I didn't want it to be so obvious. It's just a couple of days before the graduation and we're going to the airport, come on. So I needed to come up with a way to throw him off the trail. So I said to him that my frat brother, having a friend come in town, he wasn't able to get him, I agreed to go to the airport and pick him up. He's gonna be wearing one of those purple fraternity jackets. He's about six foot two, six foot three, caramel complexion, bald head guy. You can't miss him, he's a big dude. So go get him. So my son said, fine. When my son got into the airport, he saw his sister, let's say 15 yards, from the baggage claim from when he walked in. She looked up and she called out to him. Now this is someone he is born and raised with. He's looking for this person who I described. Theoretically, he should have been able to recognize his sister and go, oh, hey sis, wait, what are you doing here, right? That's not what happened. 
my son tells me that when she called him, he not even was not able to say, how did you know my name? He rather assumed that I f failed to tell him that the frat brother showed up with his children and her children, his daughter and her children. So when his niece and nephew called out to him, Uncle Ray, in that famous voice, he thought that they were her bad children. My son tells me, and my daughter tells me, because they're recounting this and laughing about it, that it wasn't until he got 10 feet from her, 10 feet, this is almost the distance between you mm -hmm. and I, that he recognized that this was his sister. Because of the power of suggestion, how is it that someone you were born and raised with is 20 feet away and you still don't recognize this is your sister because you're busy looking for the frat guy? This is the power of suggestion. So as they laughed and talked about it and we laughed and talked about how I was able to so completely trick him and what a surprise, what a gift, how exciting, how fun, later that night, without anyone knowing, I cried myself to sleep bitterly. I wept bitterly because it dawned on me that if I could do that to him, what has been done to us as mm. a people mm. around the world mm. every day in every way? Mm. I was completely devastated. And that was my first deep dive into the power of suggestion. Mm. This is serious. More than hypnotism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because this is someone you're raised with and you have, my son told me, he said he was about 10 feet away from his sister when she recognized, when he recognized that it was her. So, so in this manner, how many, or can you give us some instances that you think this thing is g happening to people that they are not aware of or we are not aware of? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the inferiority complex, I think people who suffer from an inferiority complex in many ways, if not every way, is under the power of suggestion. There's no scientific biological substantiation for inferiority. Hmm. No one is born and the doctors will say, oh, this is going to be such an inferior person. That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's not there. And so this clearly is something other than biology. And I think this is one of the ways that it begins to happen. And we do it with everything. We do it with height. We do it with gender. We do it with complexion. We do it with uh, athletic ability. We do it with singing ability, dancing, how much money you have, don't have. We find every conceivable way to express this dysfunction of having internalized the power of suggestion. Hmm. You are watching the biggest and the largest. So let's assume people are in this already. Like what happened to your son? Yes. It is, it's that kind of structure is being used on people already. Yes. What will be your structures to take them out? So it's different things with different people. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, people have to be willing to go against the rules, the rules of suggestion, the rules that say you're inferior, you're too short, you're too old to get married, you're too whatever. You have to be willing to break those rules, first and foremost. I'll give you an example. I almost never iron my clothes with an iron. I just can't bear the thought of this climate of ours and having ironed my clothes and I'm putting on hot clothes to go out into hot weather. So I rarely, rarely, rarely iron my clothes, literally. You can live with me for years and not see me iron anything. So what that means is that my, my clothing will be clean, but if you look close, you'll see that it's wrinkled. I have to be okay with that mentally. And what others might think about that is their problem. So this is some of the ways that I mean when I say you have to be willing to begin to break some of those rules. Um, you have to be uh, uh, vegans. People who are vegans go through that all the time. You have to be willing to say it's going to be weird to people that I know that I'm no longer consuming animal products and I'm okay with it. Good luck with you being okay with that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to do some of those things. You have to be willing to endure some discomfort. It's not convenient when you are coming out of that type of brainwashing, that level of brainwashing. And we should stop expecting everything to be cute and fun. It's not. 
Hmm. On two separate occasions, I was training for professional bodybuilding. And I can tell you right now, when you're training with weights, it's not cute. It's not fun. At all. As you are learning how to eat and put on lean muscle mass and carb, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, do so many reps in such, such a way that you fatigue your muscles, it's not fun. Because as your muscles begin to burn and you're burning out that lactase, everything in it says stop, it's burning. And yet professional bodybuilders know that that's when you start doing the work. So you have to be willing to endure some discomfort and be okay with that. And I think that's another part of the way of coming out of it. But then you also have to be willing to learn. Hmm. How much sense does it make to have a device, which we call a smartphone, that has given you access to every database on the planet hmm. and all you do is look at nonsense on TikTok and Instagram and what have you learned from your phone in the last week? What have you learned about titanium spark plugs? Hmm. What have you learned about the Camara Cohen uh, Sig Gamera uh, automobile and what makes its transmission and its engine so unique? What have you learned about that? What have you learned about the products that people put in most of the makeups that we put on our skin and how that affects us. What have you learned about what sleep deprivation does to learning and our capacity hmm. for memory and recall? What have you learned about how to use urine and your own waste properly and hygienically as fertilizer for your garden? What have you learned about conflict resolution? What have you learned about different systems of governance? What have you learned about animal husbandry? What have you learned about the ways in which plants communicate to each other? Hmm. What have you learned about the vibrational frequency of cancer or schizophrenia? We have these smartphones every day and we're doing dumb things with smartphones. And so knowledge is a big part of coming out of this brainwashing mm -hmm. of suggestion that we have because it gives you the map Knowledge gives mm. you the map to find out you are here. Oh, I'm here? Well, then I need to get here. And it helps to do that. So use your phones wisely. Do you know how many thousands of audiobooks are on YouTube? If you don't like to read, you can what, just push the button. When you are sleeping, just put it there and sleep. And, you and get let the person read it. to you. Let the person read to you. The destruction of African civilization is on audio on YouTube. 2,000 seasons is on audio on YouTube. Gray's Anatomy for medical students is in audio on YouTube. You can get fiction and nonfiction of just about every type of genre and book that's there on YouTube. What are we doing to ourselves? Hmm. We are fighting. We are watching, uh, watching a breast and the rest. That's what we want. Mm. You are watching the biggest. Please, so advise people on how they take suggestions from people. Yes advise us and when you are done then you tell us on how to suggest things mm -hmm. for our children and for ourselves absolutely so you be began to realize that you're taking suggestion from people when you don't check it out yourself you just take it at face value mm. or when you are too intimidated or afraid or otherwise petty to mm. speak up and voice your opinion so and so you've told me this but here's what I think about it. You just nod and you just take it and you don't question it. Hmm. The power of suggestion is like walking out in public with somebody. You see a, a open can of soda just sitting there and you tell the person, oh, here's a soda, drink. Oh, I'm not gonna tell you, why? I don't know what's in it. But you also don't know what's in what the person is telling you, but you took it and you drank it. Hmm. So it's the same, just drink. You've done the same thing with your mind with your soul. So the first thing is to have your own opinion about something, value it and express it. You've shared your opinion, I will now share mine. That's the first thing. The second thing is do your homework. When someone tells you something about titanium spark plugs, when someone tells you about how to tell the, tell the age of your tire, the month and year when it was made, when someone tells you how to regrow a chipped tooth, when someone tells you how to do scalp massages, all of these different things, take the information and then look it up for yourself. Find out for yourself, know yourself. And this is another way to go about hmm. doing that. Hmm. Okay, your advice. So to begin to realize also that the power of suggestion can also be wonderfully powerful. 
In science, they call it the placebo effect. The placebo effect, uh, and they've done so many different experiments with it, it's just astonishing. It always is what it is. The placebo effect is when the outcome happens based on you not actually doing the thing that's going to produce the outcome. So I'll tell you that this pill will clear your headache in two minutes, but it's really just a sugar pill. There's nothing to it. So mentally, I've suggested to you it's going to do that. You take it, and then guess what? It clears your headache. They've done the placebo effect with surgery, where they've done fake knee surgery, and 20, 30, 40% of people get better. With fake surgery, it wasn't even real. Hmm. They've done the placebo effect with visualization. There was a study done that said, I want this group of people to visualize that you're lifting weights. Mm -hmm. I want this group of people to do nothing. Don't touch a weight, don't look at a weight, don't say the word weight, just live your life. And I want this group of people to actually lift weights. When they came back, they found that the group that visualized lifting weight had increased lean muscle mass by 18%. Their brain. Hmm. Power of suggestion. There was another study done with free throws. They said to the group, we want you to visualize free throwing for an hour. Another group, we want you to just do nothing. Don't look at a basketball. Don't do a free throw. And this group, we want you to actually practice free throws. When they came back, the group that actually practiced free throws improved by 25%. The group that visualized improved by 24%. 24, just visualizing it. They improved on their skills when they did pre -test. This is being done in every conceivable way. So the mm -hmm. power of suggestion, I would say, is what science calls the placebo effect. It's when you suggest to yourself that something is going to be a certain kind of way just because somebody told you, mm. even though the thing they did really wasn't the thing that they did. So this is the way that we can also begin to come up out of the brainwashing, mm. the power of suggestion in a negative way by actually flipping it up on itself yeah, and using that, that, that same thing absolutely, to come up out of it the other way and to begin to visualize ourselves and suggest to ourselves information that affirms us and that's grounded in evidence-based science. We are watching the biggest, when we talk to you people about meditation and imaginations, we become demons for you. But this is what she's talking about. So how do you think we should groom our kids in this manner yes. with this powerful of power of yes. suggestion? Yes. The things we tell our people, yes. me, I'm a doctor. I want you to be a doctor. Those kind of suggestions. Yes. How do we put it? Yes. I think the sky is the limit in terms of the way that we groom our children. First of all, let your children in on this kind of information. Tell it to them. Tell it to them. Address your children in a way that you want them to answer to that. Hmm. I used to, when my son was a toddler, I used to call him sir. Sir, sir, oh sir. Because I wanted him to get accustomed to knowing that someday someone will call him a sir and it should feel natural. When two of my daughters said that they wanted to be surgeons, they were, one was in, uh, they were in high school. One I think was a freshman, the other one was a senior. I went to the medical supply store. I bought them the stethoscope. I bought them the blood pressure kit. I bought them the white doctor jacket. I had them make the label, the name tag, doctor so-and-so uh, and, -so and doctor so-and-so. And I brought it home and I gave it to them. It's the power of suggestion. It's saying that you said you wanted to be a doctor, and I know you're in high school right now, but put this on. Feel it. Walk around in it. And they walked up and down the neighborhood uh, 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 disturbing everybody. We want to take your blood pressure. We want to listen to your heart. But you see, they began to act in this kind of capacity. When my oldest daughter was nine years old, I taught her how I had a home business at that time. I taught her at nine years old how to do my business tax returns, occupational uh, privilege tax returns and consumer use tax returns. Why not? You're good with numbers. You have a lot of energy. Mm. So every month, every quarter, she would do my tax returns. She couldn't sign it legally. I had to sign it. But she, I would give her my receipts. I would give her the forms. and She was good to go. Why not? Why don't we do more of these things the with our children? The opportunity that children out there has. You've been in Ghana. We have opportunities in Ghana. 
do we not see on the African continent the children who have children, not teenagers, children who have their YouTube channels, children who are in business. Do you remember the young girl on Joy News where she was repairing small engines? Aha, uh -huh. this is a child, this is not a teenager. We have these examples here among us. The power of suggestion to engage these children professionally, to advise them professionally, to get them acclimated with professional terms, with professional ways of engaging in business. Why can't our children uh, learn how to invest and become investors? Why can't we buy treasury bills in their name and teach them about the power That's of- That's the doing of the mother. And in, at your place, you, at 18, they are paying them. We don't have that here. You see. Okay. So since you, you've been there and you are here now, you've become part of us. Everybody is watching. The president to the minister. I want you to send a message to the president. Hmm? Okay. How he should make structures for children, single parents, where you think we are falling short. When you become the president, so you put off the uh, religion. Now I'm ad asking you to add five more things you would have done to better this place. Yes. In addition, send, say it and use it as a message for the president. So first and foremost, we need to bolster academics. We need to gut the academic system and make it African-centered. Mm. Gut it and make it African-centered. You can't keep paying obeisance to foreigners and think that you're building self-esteem and think that you're contributing to the future of your country in a powerful, sustainable way. Mm. We have to learn about the rich history that we have. Uh, for instance, I learned some 800 years ago in Ghana, an Arab merchant wrote about watching a customer write a check to a Ghanaian business person. Mm. 800 years ago in Ghana, in Ghana. So we have to bring back uh, the academic system that properly affirms us. Will we learn about other people in the world? Of course. But we first and foremost have to have that foundation to learn and think and approach information the way that we do. How do we say, how do we use geometric terms in tree? Do we even know how to, how to speak in tree using uh, terms where astronomy and astrology and meteorology is concerned? Or are we using English words? And so my name from you see. Mm. So we got to revamp, regut, remodel the academic system. That would be the first thing mm -hmm. that I would say. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have to bring in aggressively organic agriculture. You cannot, the, the, what, what GMO foods do to the immune system, do to the mind, do to the body, do to the environment is nothing short of criminal. It doesn't matter about who's in bed with mm. who and who's able with their chest to disagree and produce science that's paid for by these same institutions that's poisoning you to tell you that everything is all well and good. Go and see what they are eating. Mm. So we have to bring back organic agriculture that's going to help enrich and fortify our bodies so that Ghana, Africa, Ghana indeed will never be anybody's graveyard. That is true. This is going to help us tremendously. So this is the second thing that we have to do. We have to bring back and reinforce cultural programs. Have them as infomercials on your television and radio. The Yam Festival, the Fire Festival, all of these different things. Talk about it with pride and with dignity. If the Japanese are talking about the Cherry Blossom Festival, why can't we talk about the Yam Festival with pride and with dignity and equal vim and vigor? So we have to come back and we have to celebrate that and honor that and do it aggressively where a marketing blitz ongoing is concerned. Mm. That's number three. The fourth thing is we have to do a media blitz about those of us who are coming back home. We have to use infomercials and edutainment to educate the masses about who we are and who we are not and what our relationship is to each other. Who are we to each other? We need to be reminded, some of us have amnesia, and we need to be reminded, we need to be helped through no fault of our own. And so we need an infusion of this into the culture. And then the, fourth, the fifth thing I would say is that we need to strategically bring our family from different walks around the planet into our governance structure. There are South Sudanese in Ghana. There are Bayesians, people from Barbados in Ghana. 
We know there are Nigerians in Ghana, there are Kenyans in Ghana. Where are their talents? Where are their voices? How can we benefit from each other if this is not being reflected in the infrastructure of our governance system? Mm. We have diaspora, whether they are Ghanaians or non-Ghanaians, who are now coming back. How can they be reflected in the infrastructure of our governance? We have a lot to learn from them. The people who I have the most in common is South Sudanese. Culturally, I have the most in common with South Sudanese, yet I'm here in Ghana unapologetically, with my citizenship, even voting in the last election, I'm okay. But how can I tell you, in the time that we have on the show, how I have benefited from South Sudanese? Why are we keeping these things from ourselves? We need to formalize it. So that would be the fifth way. They brought us education. Out there, your children go to school with phones, right? Even those yes. in primary school. Yes. And we are here, as a, 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 SHS. We don't give them phones and somebody's child will fall sick and die before the parents get there. I don't know why we make everything barry. We want to kill ourselves. for uh, We are overlearning from whatever they brought to us. Nobody is bitter. Nobody is bitter. Nobody is actually, uh, nobody can actually do anything to you. It's your choice. To be like, this is my comfort zone. I don't want it. I want to move. If you decide not to move, Nobody will do anything to you. All these things are things that we can at, at least throw light on. And then we are able to do greater stretches for our generation. Liberation starts from here. Hmm. Thank you so much for coming here. Is there anything you want to add? Is there anything you want to tell the public? You know, we really need to get behind the eight ball where mental health is concerned. We really do. There's so many benefits from it, and we need to make the most of it. My model has been for decades, it helps to have somebody to talk to, and it really does. When we are in therapy with the right therapist, it's not always about breaking down and crying and sobbing and all these things, though sometimes it happens. In fact, my experiences have been men cry more often than women. That we have other things to benefit from in terms of a professional perspective or a professional weighing in on the things that we're going through. And it doesn't always have to be massive devastation that we're bringing into the therapist's office. We don't go to the doctor only when mm -hmm. we're at death, death's door. We go there when we've broken a finger. We go there when there's something in our eye and we can't remove it. It doesn't always have to be a life-threatening mm. issue. So let's use this science called psychology to our own advantage. Do you know that on some of the medu netter, what the Greeks call hieroglyph, on the walls in ancient Kemet, what the Greeks call Egypt, do you know that there are medu netter of a psychiatric clinic this many thousand years ago among mm -hmm. Africans? Mm -hmm. It's there. Why are we abandoning it? So mm -hmm. I think the thing that I would say is look to people to make the most of it. Make the most of it. You owe it to yourself to hire a professional to help dig you out of the hole that you're in. And then stay with it. Stay with it. Do that periodically check in, you know, to keep yourself grounded and well and balanced. So that would be the last thing that I would use. Thank you so, 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 so Thank much you. for coming. We appreciate your presence on this platform. We do appreciate you. Thank you for coming. Abusia. A word to a wise is in the northern region. So if you don't take any of this, we don't know what to do for you. Revelations will do everything for us to make sure we liberate our continent. Thank you so much for watching The Biggest. Shalom. Peace.